have um, lost my place. Sorry. <laughs> That's because I'm looking at Saturdays. My bad there. Uh, Chris French. Uh, this is clearly the track to be in for security education. He's going to be speaking on 10 reasons your security education program sucks. So let's hear those reasons. Here's Chris. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, he's right. This is definitely the track to be in. I was, uh, I was excited to see not being the only uh, security education talk today, so that's awesome. Glad you guys came out. Um, so just a little bit of relevant intro before we uh, dive in here. Uh, I'm the manager of application security, risk, and compliance at Highland Software in Westlake. Um, by the way, we're hiring. If you're looking for a job, come talk to me. Uh, I'm also founder of Clevesec, an uh, information security group in Cleveland. Uh, another information security group in Cleveland, Northeast Ohio Information Security Forum, board member there, and I help out with OWASP Cleveland on occasion. So, work a lot in education, it's pretty much my job, uh, full time and outside. So, these are the things I've seen work, these are the things I've seen fail horribly, we're going to work through something together. So, um, hands up if you've heard this said aloud about information security. Hands up if you've said this yourself about information security. Right, it's true, it's important. InfoSec is uh, no exception to this rule. Um, here's another one. Hands up if you've said this one aloud. A few people admitting to it, good. All right, all right. What about this one? This one was a little, uh, this one came from quite a famous location. This was uh, Bruce Schneier came out and said, this is a waste of time and resources. Um, we've had a few people agree with this and uh, at this point in my career, I don't feel prepared to disagree with Bruce Schneier, except on this matter. I'm going to wholly disagree with him, and I kind of feel like, shame on you if you've said this kind of thing. This is the kind of thing we need to really work on. These are the kind of things that our industry is really missing. We have 100 people doing malware analysis. We have 1,000 people doing network traffic analysis. We have all these things happening. Very few people working on this very important problem um, when we all agreed that this is our biggest problem, right? So. We're going to dive into 10 reasons that your security education program sucks. Um, if you don't have a security education program right now, congratulations, you get a head start on everybody else. Um, if you do have one, hopefully you don't recognize too many of your own things happening here, but hey, we're all here to learn, we're all here to build, and um, that's what we're going to do. So uh, the genesis for my security education uh, programs have, has been the Bill Gates memo from 2002, I believe, the Trustworthy Computing Memo, where he talked about we're going to do a culture shift at Microsoft. We are going to make computing as reliable as uh, utilities. People know that they're, when they pick up their phone, it's going to work. They should have the same trust in their computing systems. Um, we have to, so to, to do that, we have to put an entire culture shift in. And as a lot of you know, they shut down the entire .NET division um, to train people up for some time and then put them through this training. Um, and you know that didn't involve just a single demographic. You have to put um, you know, young people through this, older people through this, uh, inexperienced, experienced, uh, you know, technical, non-technical, uh, all kinds of things. And we're going to walk through the things I've experienced while trying to build these from the ground up. So, uh, number one, the biggest problem I've ever seen and continues to be, uh, this is number one because it's the foundation for everything else. You'll see it creep up over and over again. And that's that you don't care enough, but then you expect your users to. Uh, just this morning, we had Jason talk to a full room of people saying, you know, we need to work on security. You guys get to do all this cool stuff. Um, we need to work on education. And everyone's nodding and applauding. And then look around the room, right? We had a, just had a fantastic talk, just last talk. Also not as well attended as this morning. This talk, not as well as attended this morning. People agree that this is a problem, but they're not willing to do anything for it. But you guys are here now. I really appreciate that. Thank you for coming. You're here to, you're here to do something about it, show that you care. That's all, that's step one. That's all we really ask. So I'm sure you guys are like me. Every year you go to these conferences, you watch the videos, whatever, and you hear people bitch about this, right? Oh, we have HIPAA, we have socks, and my managers think that's security, and I can't get anything by it. Uh, you know, when will they see that compliance isn't security? But then these people go back to their day jobs, and they continue training in that context. They use these standards as their genesis for their training programs. Uh, they think, you know, what do we need to do? Teach these users to make sure that we are in line with these, as they say. Um, we have to tell our users certain things. These standards say we do, so we'll teach them, you know, how much, how little interaction can I have with the office workers before I can go back to the knock and, like, avoid everybody for the rest of the year. 
and I definitely think that's the wrong approach. Um, especially when you decide that the best way to do this is go ahead and ship all of our users this 212 page document. Say go ahead and read it, click that you read it or sign or whatever at the end. So we have a document that says, hey, 40% uh, of people signed this document within the first week, the rest within two weeks later. We're, we achieved so much compliance. Look at our metrics. They're insane. We're killing it out there with security education. Um, but look at it. Who's actually reading this? I am interested in this stuff. I'm not reading this. This is 212 pages. It's the it's a PCI uh, audit list or something like that. Um, it, this, this just reeks of someone who doesn't care. If you are putting something out like this that you know they're not going to read, that really is only designed to keep your boss off your back and keep auditors from being too suspicious, something you didn't even review, say you bought a uh, some sort of off-the-shelf education system and you're like, yeah, this one's been recommended by a few people, ship that out to the users and they get through the quizzes and whatever and then you get the document back, we're so much percent compliant, use that as your metric. That shows that you don't care. <clears throat> um, this, this quote got thrown around earlier too. Um, showing up is 80% of life. That's uh, been attributed to Woody Allen. Uh, I'm really, in my teams I like to say, I, a lot of my engineers like to over-engineer things. They start to rebuild the wheel, so to speak. So I like to say, you know, guys, this is a solved problem. Like, let's step back and like take a look at what other people have done, try and work off of that. I don't know that information security education falls into that, but there are people working on it. Uh, I'm one of them. We just had uh, Chris up here to speak. He's one of them. I've had a couple other talks up here uh, at this conference. If you missed them, you can catch them on video later. People are working on this. So if you have this problem, get involved with them, come to the talks, talk to them. You know, uh, like I said, the first step to showing that you care is just honestly showing up. And then, once you've done that, start getting involved. These people all put contact information at the end of their slides for a reason. Right? Reach out to them. They're looking for new ideas to inject into their systems. They're looking for people to kind of copy what they've done, build off of it. Uh, steal it. If that's all you're going to do, that's fine too, but at least you're getting some part, some knowledge of what everyone else is doing. All right. Number two, your managers don't care enough, but again, you expect your users to. This one we have to be careful with. Um, there's a big difference between your managers don't care enough being a reason that your information security program sucks and an excuse for why. Um, if you want a shift in culture, which is what security education, true security education requires, you need some buy-in from the top. Um, anyone who thinks that they can do this from the bottom up on their own is fooling themselves. It's just, it, at a certain point, it becomes impossible. Jeez, my slides are slow. Okay. Uh, this is something that I kind of learned the hard way. When I first got involved in security education, I was just a, our lowest rung of QA tester at, at my company. And I noticed that our security testing was pretty weak. We were very reactive and didn't have much of an education program or anything. So I started this grassroots movement. I'm like, let's find some other people that are interested. Let's get together and talk once a week uh, at lunch, off the clock, whatever it takes. And then we slowly start building momentum um, to, get, to, get this, to get this grassroots movement going. Um, I was way too low on the totem pole to go to my manager and ask for $50,000 to, uh, to get this system going. Uh, I don't know that that would have helped. but. You know, this is, these are the, these, we work within the constraints that we have. The problem is, though, that grass can only reach a certain height, right? Um, it became pretty quickly apparent that it didn't really matter how passionate my little group of people were. The people at the top had all the control, and they could squash us any time they pleased. You're taking too much time from my team. You are you're starting to interfere with uh, other, th other projects we're working on. These people don't have time to be doing these things. Any one of these could have easily shut us down because, again, low people on a totem pole. Um, the key reason that you need manager buying is because if you ever want to expand beyond people who are already interested, you need to get their leaderships involved. Uh, attitude on teams reflects leadership 100% of the time. If managers come in, and even if you can manage to get something mandatory, if you can tell them your people need to go through this um, by the, because the CEO says by the end of the month, and they don't agree with it, they'll go to their team and be like, okay, guys, we have to do this thing, and just get through it and go there. So they will click through your training and end and walk away because they know their managers are okay with it. They're not concerned with what anybody else thinks. If their managers are telling them that they're not really interested, the team's not going to be interested either. So you have to get involvement at every level. Jeez. All right. 
And to get management on board, you have to make it make sense to them. Um, there was even a whole talk today dedicated to just doing this. Great talk, I suggest you look into it. Um, so talk about money, talk about what they can gain, talk about what they might not lose if, you, if they listen to you. Um, people are risk averse, especially when it comes to their money. Talk about litigation. Uh, no one wants to end up in a courtroom. Right? Talk about how you can keep them out of that courtroom with uh, just a simple little program that you're working to put together. And by the way, here's the plan. Um, loss of reputation, angry customers, nobody wants bad publicity. Learn yourself some Excel and just mock up one of these bad boys. Like this, do you know how long this takes to put together? I pulled this off Google Images. Like this is, this is junk. But you know what? It's a chart. Executives love charts, right? Toss something together, talk them through it, show that you care, show that you've put some effort into this kind of thing. And then possibly the most effective, talk about what it can do for their persona. Talk about what it can do for them in the security community. Um, make them a rock star, right? CEO, this guy cares about security. He's promoting it to his people. CEOs talk to other CEOs. When he goes to these lunches or whatever, he's talking to them, oh yeah, we just put this great security program together. My people are killing it. We got this, this, and this. And the other CEOs are going to be like, we're not doing anything like that. He's going to be the cool guy at the dinner. They would love to do that. And if none of this works, you can do the old fallbacks. Hit Gartner, talk about competitive advantages. Um, anything we can do to make our executives appear smarter to the outside world, they're going to love us for. And then finally, make it easy for them to say yes. This is the, this is the part about, oh, by the way, I have the program right here. right? Um, when I did this, I actually went quite overboard and handed them uh, this like 10-page proposal that I had drafted up to every manager who would take it. And I was like, here, this is the time requirements you're going to need from your people. Here's what we're going to put them through. And then six months later, that plan was meaningless. We actually kind of went completely different direction, but it didn't matter. The fact that I showed that I had done some preparation and that I was actually interested in what I was talking about, that I knew what I was talking about, that I had kind of put some thought into this. It wasn't just a spur of the moment thing that I was trying to take time and money away from the organizations with. Uh, made it much easier for them to say yes. Uh, the more you can do for them, the less that they have to do, the more likely they are to agree to your things. And yeah, that's a lot of work. Um, putting those metrics together on the previous slide, um, putting the charts together, putting the presentations together, putting together some sort of proposal, figuring out how much time this is going to take, all of that stuff does take time. It's going to take a lot of time and energy on your part, but that's what it goes back to. You have to care, because if you don't care, you're not going to put the energy in to do these things. You're going to make it harder for your executives to say yes. You're going to make your job harder in the long run. All right, number three, you don't speak the language of the people that you are training, but then you're frustrated when they just nod politely at you. Um, a big mistake I see in presenting is when people ask, how many people in the room don't understand something? Almost no one's going to raise their hand at this. When we had a marketing meeting and the person that was presenting was like, said, uh, said something about stateful HTML or HTTP requests, and he's like, who doesn't understand what stateful and stateless is? Half the people in the room didn't know what it was, but not a single person raised their hand. Who wants to look stupid in front of their peers? Right? You have to get up and you have to figure out what they know and translate what you're trying to teach them into those words. Um, one of my vice presidents most recently called information security the most difficult intellectual pursuit that one can follow. I think that's a little overblown, but we all know how difficult this job is, right? Um, we read news stories every day. We're on some sort of social media. We come to conferences like this during the week and on our weekends. And not to speak of all the training that we do on our own, home labs, all this stuff, just to kind of stay average in this industry, right? This is a, this is a difficult job. Um, so when we come in and try and t tell everybody the sum no total of what we've learned, they, they'll never get it. So what do we do about that? Does anybody know what academic creep is? Right. So, so the idea is that we have all been climbing this staircase forever of knowledge. Right. We know what an exploit is. We know what a vulnerability is. We get these vocabulary pieces. We get these tiny sets of skill, and we see how little we still know. Right. Look at all this stuff out here. I still don't understand, and we assume that everyone else has already climbed these stairs underneath us, and we have to talk at our level because everyone's smarter than us. But that's not the case. Right. Academic creep is us not knowing that. No one else has climbed the staircase yet. We can teach them everything that we've gone up from the bottom. Uh, my favorite description of this was a few years ago. Uh, Chris Nickerson gave a talk where he said, uh, it's, 
our approach to edu uh, education is like giving you a book in Italian that's like, here, read this book, it'll make you a security rock star, but it's in Italian. But you don't speak Italian, and then I get mad at you when you didn't read the book. Why didn't you read the book, man? I told you it's going to make you a security rock star, but you don't speak Italian. Whose fault is that? Is that my fault or is that your fault? That's my fault, right? I should know what languages you speak. I should know how to communicate to you if I want to make sure that my knowledge gets distributed properly. Um, so I'm going to give you a little inside info here. This is an actual slide that I gave to our, uh, uh, as part of a presentation that I gave to our sales team. The only goal of my presentation here was that our salespeople were accidentally telling our customers that we encrypt passwords instead of that we hash them. So I put this slide together and I showed them the difference. And my point was, don't ever say that we encrypt passwords ever again. Now, do you think I told them that sometimes these are different keys and sometimes they're the same key? No. Do you think I told them the names of these algorithms? No. I didn't mention initialization vectors. I didn't mention salting. I didn't mention encryption modes. None of that stuff got mentioned. Is it a little disingenuous? And is this eh, very simplified? Yeah, it definitely is. But did it get the point across? Absolutely it did. And do any of our salespeople say that we encrypt passwords anymore? Not to my knowledge. I really hope they don't. This is they. They seem to get it. They ask a few questions. This isn't complete knowledge. It's not everything I know about these two subjects, but it was all I needed to get across to them to complete our goals. Uh, just likewise, we sell a module called Encrypted Disk, which is basically just native encryption of data. Uh, they didn't understand how it works, so they weren't selling it properly. Um, again, very simplified. Uh, did I mention what is actually happening with this arrow, which is probably 10,000 lines of code? No. All I showed them was, here's what a piece of data looks like. You all know what a text file is. You can read that. Here's what it looks like after it's been encrypted. You can't read it. That's all. Right? They don't need to know how this is working. Uh, they don't need to know the modes. They don't need to know the names. They don't need to know anything like this. But now when they tell our customers we do native encryption of our file systems, they know what they're talking about and they can kind of visualize it in their mind and they can speak about it more intelligently because they've had this tiny bit of education. Uh, the point here is, you, you know, put as little information on the screen as you can. Make sure you know what your goal is. Again, our goal was to make sure that people understood exactly what was happening here so they could speak intelligently about it. And then give that information and stop. Unless somebody asks you for more information, in which case I would suggest pulling them aside because you're going to start to lose people if you start going. If I was like, yeah, we use AES-256, oh wait, let me back up. AES is Advanced Encryption Standard. Actually, let me back up one more time. So that's not an actual encryption standard. It's just a standard that people put uh, their algorithms into competition to get. It's not, it's not worth it. We're losing people. It doesn't get them anything. right? We know the goal. We teach to that minimum standard, and we move on. Now, this is slightly different. Um, I'm very proud of this one, mostly because um, this guy on my team put this slide together, and I've never seen anybody be able to explain cross-site request forger in one slide before. I was super proud of him, uh, and I get to, I like to show this off everywhere I can. Uh, so these were more technical people, right? These aren't salespeople again. Um, so they at least have some understanding. They know what all these things are. They know what a server is. They know what a URL is. They know how things are transferred around. But look how simple this is. Again, is cross-site request forger more complicated than this? Yeah, it is. But does this get the message across? Do they now understand how this works and they can use this information in their testing and their developing to know what at least what we are saying when the security team comes up to them and says, hey, we found a cross-site scripting error. Uh, the QAC people can now test for it. They can go out on their own and find more information if they want it or they can come to us. They at least now have some idea where they didn't have any before. Again, know your goal. Our goal is to introduce our people to these concepts. One slide for a, a concept as complicated as CSRF you can do one slide for anything else, honestly. Yep. So like I said, keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, know what your goal is. Um, stop once you've given all the information you want. I know it's tempting to keep going because you're excited. You're like, you don't understand how, uh, how exciting cross-site request forgery is. All the things I can do with it, let me tell you, like I could hijack your browser tomorrow. And you would not even, but it doesn't matter. They don't need to know these things. They need to know one thing. You have to identify what it is that they need to know. You have to teach to it and then stop. Don't get greedy. So number four, you are a terrible speaker, but you expect them to listen. Does anybody here think that they're a terrible public speaker? Right? Yeah. 
it's not it's not easy. We can talk about my speaking abilities, but I'm up here anyway. Um, but you know what? I, I like to say that if you are in, from, in, in information security and you've decided that public speaking isn't a skill you need to develop, you have no excuse for that. You have you've kind of resigned yourself to being a mediocre information security professional. And a lot of us accept that we don't really know this skill and that we don't need it, so we don't develop it. Uh, this is a list of just security groups in the Cleveland area. I'm sure Detroit has a similar list. Um, this is just security. This doesn't even include the thousands of tech groups that are part of there. Uh, there's at least three groups for every different programming language. There's all kinds of groups out there. And running one myself, I can tell you, the most difficult part of this is getting speakers. You know, you have to get people that are, have something to say. They have to be willing to present it. They have to be willing to do it at a date and time that you need them to. And then you have to convince them to show up. And then when the day comes, hope that they actually do show up. Right? It's not, it's not an easy prospect. So if you need to develop your speaking skills, find a group in your area. I'm sure MySec would love to have you. Uh, and come out and give a talk, right? Uh, even, honestly, even if it's just something as simple as, hey, uh, I downloaded this tool last week and I'm learning to use it. Here's what I've learned so far and here's where I got stuck. And it's 15 minute talk and you're like, so hopefully one of you guys can figure out why I got stuck like this and come talk to me about it. And some people in the, learn the room had never seen that tool before and now they can go explore it. Someone in the room has gotten past that point where you're stuck and now you get their knowledge and you're getting more contacts in the community. And most importantly, you've just gotten yourself 15 minutes of public speaking experience and all kinds of other ancillary benefits just for sending an email to an organizer and saying, hey, when's your next one? I'd like to come out and talk about this. All right. Um, if you don't want to do that, there are a couple other ways. So the way that I kind of got comfortable with it is through running meetings. Uh, about, I would say about two years ago, if somebody had told me, hey, you're going to be running the meeting tomorrow, I would get a like knot in my stomach like you wouldn't believe and like, spend the next couple days preparing and like running over my speech a hundred times and like it would drive me insane. But what I had to do was I knew that a lot of these projects weren't going to get done if I wasn't the one leading them. So because I cared and because I wanted to see these things through, I had to kind of get over my fear and shake at meetings and, you know, my voice would shake and I would, you know, have many panic attacks in the meeting, but I had to get through them uh, so that these initiatives would get done. And the more times you do that, you become immune to it. You start to get comfortable with it. You start getting up there and you start being more conversational. You get what you want across. Um, if you don't want to do that or if you're not in a position to do that, some environments aren't conducive to that. Toastmasters is a great thing. I've never been, but I hear fantastic things. Quite a few people. This guy says it's great. Uh, they're everywhere, too. Like, I do not know a single place that doesn't have a Toastmasters chapter somehow. And you even get, like, nifty certifications and stuff. Like, go through there. Those guys know what they're doing. They've been around for, what, a couple decades at least. And uh, so definitely check that out. And it's, it's widely recognized. You might even be able to toss that on your resume. And again, most importantly, you get public speaking experience. You get some experience getting your stuff out there. And then when you go back to your company, you can translate those skills to something you actually want to get done. Find your voice. This is the most important thing I'm getting at here. It's going to take some time, and uh, it's going to force you out of your comfort zone. But you know what? You guys are in information security. You live outside of your comfort zone. You chose this. So you know what? Take another step outside of your comfort zone into, a, into public speaking and step up. It's not that hard, honestly. All right. Number five, your slides are ridiculous, um, but you expect comprehension. Uh, I like to, when I give this talk, I like to go first in the day because I like to see how many people start to scramble and change their slides afterwards. And also, if I do it afterwards, some people think I'm calling them out for their particular slides. Just know if you've given a talk already today, I'm not calling you out, but these are the bad things I've seen that happen to slides. So. <clears throat> Walls of text, great place to start. Um, my favorite thing about this slide, you hear everybody laugh. Everyone knows this slide is bad, yet someone made it, right? You all know this slide is bad, but I guarantee at least half of you have made a slide exactly like this at some point in your life. Um, my favorite thing about this is the speaker will usually say, I'm not going to make you read all this and then like skip over it. Or they'll say, like, oh, uh, you know, I'll just sit here while you guys read it. And you're like, aren't you speaking, bro? Like, what are you? What are you making me read for? Uh, 
So <laughs> if you're not going to read it, uh, or if you're going to make other people read it, just don't include it. Like, find other ways to communicate your ideas. The only time it's acceptable to put a wall of text like this on a slide is if you're going to go, man, look at that wall of text. Isn't that shitty? Like, look how, look how much crap we have to give to people. Like, and even then, it has to be small enough that people can't read it. Because if people start to read it, they're not listening to you speak. All right. So try not to fall asleep. This is an example. It'll be gone soon, I promise. Look at these bullets. There are four levels of bullets on this slide, right? This is not a slide. This is a goddamn document, right? You can't paste a document into a slide and pretend it's a presentation. All this does, if I'm sitting in your audience, is scream that I don't know my stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about if I have to have a slide like this because I'm essentially reading the slide to you. If that was the case, why don't I just print this on a document and hand it out to you guys? I should know what I'm talking about. I should have minimal stuff on the slides. I shouldn't have to read it to you. Um, my favorite part of this slide is actually the title. Um, it's like 17 words long. What value is that adding to the slide? If you have if you have titles on your just because PowerPoint asks you for a title on your slide, you don't have to do it. Putting that there doesn't add value. It takes room away from you. Clearly, you need real estate on this slide, and it's taking room away. So just get rid of it. Unless it's unless it's really really cognizant to your point, just drop it. Also, you can see this is a slide from Boeing, so like even even large companies don't have their stuff together on this. What's up? I, I definitely hear what you're saying, but at the same time, there's nothing worse than, than the slide that's useless. Like, 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 Absolutely. We will get to that. But excellent point. The point was um, that if you have to know, uh, if you have to review these slides later on your own, you have to know what the presenter was getting at. So you have to find a balance between what's too much information for the people actually in the room and what's not enough information for the people reviewing your slides later. And we do have a solution for that. I'll talk about it in a minute. So here's another one. Um, this one kind of combines the best of several worlds. Uh, not only does it have a wall of text in it, but also it's on three bullets, which are, or no, sorry, four bullets. See, I can't even see. Four bullets. Um, that are all embedded on this awesome background that makes sure you can't read anything that's up there. This slide is useless to everybody. Uh, you can't read it. There's too much information. These bullets aren't helping you. And you're reading it instead of listening to the presenter talk. Um, whoever made it wasted their time doing it. They should have just put a document together. And the audience got nothing out of it. I'm here to tell you that PowerPoint is not that hard. Uh, to make a point, so actually when I started this presentation, I had my nifty, like, uh, customized theme and all this stuff put together, and I was like, no, you know what? I'm going to make a point. Everything in this presentation has been done with PowerPoint defaults. This, with the green thing and the gradient, this is all, this is a PowerPoint default theme. This font here, I didn't even change it. This is the default font that comes on the thing. All I did was change the size. PowerPoint, the meaning of it has gotten lost. PowerPoint was meant as a replacement for people actually having poster board over here with visual aids on it, right? You want something to illustrate your point. You want something to punctuate your point. You don't want something for the audience to read. Right now, my point is put big words on your slide. Sam, in the back, can you read this? Yeah. yeah, you can, right? Could you read those other slides? No. And you know what? This projector is way too damn big for this room. And not every, not every room has a projector that's appropriate size for the room. Put big words on your slides. Put something that you want people to focus on. This is your main point for the slide. They will listen to you talk because they can't. Have you guys been sitting here reading the words, big words, over and over again while I've been talking? Have you? That's weird. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to judge. If you want to, they're still up there. Keep going. Mm -hmm. But it stops you also from putting in too many words, right? If you have this large text on here, you can't fill up your slide with a name wall of text. Pictures. Guys, do you know how many pictures there are on the internet? So many. <laughs> at, there are at least, I did a study, there are at least 700 pictures on the internet, you guys. Look at this, you got, well, I, put, I typed in pictures into Google Image Search, and they're like, you want cool pictures? Yeah, of course I want cool pictures. You want puppies or animals or flowers? I'm like, guys, figure out something that illustrates your point and just take it down and put it up. Um, find something a little clever. You know, it doesn't have to be super clever. Everyone in the room has to get it. Uh, 
Now, if you're going to sell your slides or you're getting paid, definitely the classy thing to put some attribution up or find something that's not labeled for reuse. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not going to sell these. I probably should put more attribution in here, but I don't. I'll leave that to you. Um, but yeah, if you're going to make some money, don't be an asshole. Attribute or pay for pictures or get free ones. Definitely use pictures, though. So this is, uh, we're going to get a little meta. This is how you make sure that people understand what's in your slides after you've handed them out. And it also improves your public speaking. Use presenter notes. Don't put a script in there. That will fuck you up big time. I did that the first few times. I was like, I'm just going to put in here everything I'll say. Then I can just read it. What's going to happen, though, is you're going to get off your script. And you're going to start doing it. And you're going to lose your place. And then you're going to get all paranoid that you forgot something. And you're going to be standing here going, hold on, guys. I need to. Oh, right. And then you, either way, even if you can deliver that, you still sound like you're reading. The audience knows. Just know your stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to do this. Put little blurbs in here um, so, that, so that it reminds you of what you're going to say. Don't, don't put in paragraphs. Um, obviously, you have to know what you're talking about to do this, but kind of prerequisite to presenting, I would think. Um, that's what I'm doing down here. That's why I keep looking down occasionally. I have these little blurbs down here. Uh, so this slide is last slide. This says, uh, pictures. Guys, do you know how many fucking pictures are on the internet? So many. <laughs> right? It's not, it's, it's, you know, just little blurbs. Just put it up there. <laughs> this is actually what that last slide, this is what I saw. I swear to God. Not hard. Little look behind the curtain. All right. More stuff. So, uh, again, these are all defaults in PowerPoint. Everything I've done here. Did nothing custom. Uh, I don't know shit about color and whatnot. I'm terrible. If someone, like, I had to paint a wall in my apartment and I had, like, an anxiety, like, I, I don't know, a color. Like, I, my colors I do not get. But you know what? Microsoft and Apple and anybody else that makes these kind of things pays people who do know about color and fonts and all these things to put this stuff in their software. So if you don't know how to do it, just use the, look, I click this one and that one, and now my presentation looks like somebody who knows what they're talking about with color put together, because I don't. Uh, borders. This is a big thing that honestly adds so much professionalism to your presentation that so many people miss. You can do a lot of, uh, you can set how many pixels and what color you want your borders to be and stuff. But in the interest of defaults, I just clicked that button right there on all these pictures and add this nice little border on it. It's got these shadows. Look how much, di how much more professional this picture looks compared to that one. And all it really is, is a border. This looks like it belongs in the presentation. That looks like I just pasted it in and threw it up there. Selection pane. Super hidden functionality, apparently. Uh, I actually didn't know this existed until four or five years ago in PowerPoint. I'm sure the same thing exists in Keynote. Find this and attach it to your bar up there. What this allows you to do is interact with everything you've done in a PowerPoint slide as though they're like layers in Photoshop. You can put them on top and below each other and rearrange and stuff and uh, flatten and collapse. It does all kinds of awesome stuff that you don't have to like click, drag, nope, drag. Like you're going to mess with it forever. Super easy. <coughs> All right, number six, you rely on computer-based training, and then you wonder why your compliance is actually low, even though your CBT numbers are super high. This especially applies when you don't care about the content, um, when you kind of just buy something off the shelf and ship it to your users, and what do they do? This is what they do to your CBT. Click next, 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 agree. Yeah, I did it. Done. Gets sent to you. John Smith did his CBT. But then when it comes time to an actual incident, it comes time for him to do his job, he can't do any of those things because he treated it like a license agreement. Something he had to get through, done. Nothing gets learned. Uh, nothing gets gained by your organization unless your goal is to get high numbers on some spreadsheet somewhere. Um, this isn't what I want in my organization. I imagine that's not what you guys want in yours because it's here, because you're here to learn. Um, CBT can be a great tool, don't get me wrong. Um, if you apply, uh, deploy it appropriately and review it to make sure it's quality content, make sure it's the content you want to get across, it can be very, very helpful. But too many people kind of just buy something off the shelf, maybe that their auditor suggested, or maybe that something that's been being used at the company for 20 years, they're like, sure, ship it out. That's our security training once a year. Uh, it's lazy, generic, and it shows that you really don't care. <clears throat> Number seven, your content isn't relatable. Um, Apparently running out of time, so I gotta skip it. So this uh, slide, I said I gave it to our sales team. 
or sorry, I gave this to our QA team, did not give this to the sales guys, right? If I had given this to them, I would have had blank stares all across. More importantly, it's not relevant to their jobs at all. I had to customize the training for every single role that we gave the training to. Uh, the goal of this training is to make sure that these people know what they need to know to do their jobs in a more secure manner. Uh, this is the part of the reason that CBT is so bad. When you toss CBT out to the entire company, more than likely, everybody's getting the same training. It's on par with sexual harassment training or uh, like antitrust standards or whatever else you got to send to your people. Just another thing in that list that they have to do. That's how they'll treat it. You don't want them doing that. You want to customize it to their role, make sure it makes sense to them. For instance, when you teach your receptionist stuff, do you think when I taught our receptionist how to be more secure at their jobs, I showed them this, hey, receptionist, learn what cross-site request forgery is because someone might try to hide it your browser? No, man, they don't have the background for that. They don't understand it. Give them this book. This thing reads like a romance novel, right? Story after story. And all the time they're learning about, hey, somebody called and asked me something like that once. Like that's so when you got executive assistants and you got uh, receptionists and whoever, you know, tailor the training to them. Don't give the same training to them that you gave to the tech people. There's no quicker way to lose an audience than to not make sure that the content is related to them. Number eight, you don't test and repeat, um, but then you expect attention and retention. So Testing and repeating is all about making sure that people don't just get this once a year sexual harassment, antitrust training. Make sure that's a continuous project, something that they deal with all the time, something that they're continually going through. And make sure that what's not working gets removed from your training. Uh, A-B testing can be done for this. A-B testing is when you split a group in half and you put one training through, that, uh, through them and you put another set of training through them and you figure out which one works better and then kind of take individual pieces. It's more complicated than that, but you get the idea. Um, get some metrics. Find out what's working, find out what's not. Make sure your people are getting the information that they need. Make sure that the results that you're looking for are actually being met. And if they're not, throw your education system out and start over again. Number nine, you treat it too much like work, but then you want your audience to be conscious throughout the whole thing. Uh, like I said, you don't want to be just another sexual harassment, whatever training. Uh, Hope Jason doesn't mind me throwing his picture up there, but it illustrates it so perfectly. We go to these hacker cons and dress like this, and there's DEF CON Jason, and then over there he's in a suit, right? Uh, he's all excitable here, and uh, he talks about things. He's passionate, he's pointing fingers, swearing. This is uh, Ben 10, if you've never seen him speak. Dude is super excitable all the time, screaming at the audience, pointing, like jumping around. He's over here, camera cannot keep track of him. Great talk, great speaker, very engaging. Now these two, I'm sure, don't have this problem, but most of us, I imagine, if we speak like this at a conference, go back to our office and it's very like, all right, so today we are going to talk about information security. You don't want to make anybody in HR mad, whatever, but you know what? you got to take some of that passion with you back to work because your audience is going to fall asleep otherwise. Uh, this is a presentation that we gave uh, during our first iteration of security training. Um, our education person, we have an education department, they told us, take this out, no one's going to understand what this joke is. We're like, dude, we're talking to a tech company. We threw a Lord of the Rings joke in there. That's the most accessible joke on the planet. We left it in. Now, in hindsight, this presentation is terrible, by the way. It's recorded somewhere. You can watch it if you want to make fun of me at some point. This, this presentation is terrible, but we thought it was awesome at the time. Example of testing. You go through, you try something. You're going to look back at your first iteration of this and like cringe at how bad it was, but you got to do it through the bad to get to the good. Point is, everyone in the room got it. They laughed. They chuckled. They're part of the group. They're part of the joke. Kept them involved. You know, it's not it's not difficult. Look how you know little effort I put into this joke, honestly. Yeah, it's terrible. So keep these people interested. Keep it relevant to them. Have a nice multicultural handshake with like some people that you don't never generally interact with. Uh, if you are presenting stuff as a friend, as someone they know, if you've gone out to them before and they were letting you know, talk to them about something that was relevant to them, it's a lot more engaging than if you are just, oh, the security guy's got like training for us again. They don't even know your name. You're a security guy, right? Get out there. Get these things, uh, get these people involved. All right, number 10. I think the easiest and the least used. You don't convey the cool. What is wrong with you guys? You got into this job, why? Come on. It's cool. That's not what I was trying to do, though. I'm frozen. There we go. Lead hackers, right? I'm not going to lie. I saw sneakers, and I was like, yeah, I'm getting into that stuff. You serious? Right? We all have something like that. You, there's all kinds of cool stuff that people want to do in this industry. You all have a special interest within information security that keeps you going in it. You're like, man, look how cool this stuff is. I can uh, crack passwords. I can do whatever. I can do all these things. 
But then when it comes time to train your people on information security, you leave all the cool stuff out. Why? Why do that? Our most successful campaign, I feel like we did uh, this thing called Security Week, where there was classes and then activities, and we got to make people feel like they were hackers for a day. Um, we got to teach them how to, we pulled up Hashcat, and we're like, make a password. We're not going to look. It has to be a month, though, and a year. Like, they're like, okay, that's going to be secure enough. April 2014, whatever. And then we're like, all right, run this script. All they really were doing is hitting up and then enter, and it's like, spit the password out. And they were like, whoa. I'm a super hacker now. Like, they didn't write the script, they didn't write the command, but who cares? They don't care. All they did was go home to their wife. You will not believe where I did it work today. My partner put a password in, and I was like, boop, boop, boom, hacked it. Hacked the password. Done. I'm a super hacker now. Another one, we, uh, we went up to a receptionist, and we told her, hey, um, people are going to come up, and they're going to call you, and they're going to ask for, they're going to try and get your antivirus version off of you. Here's the number you tell them. Now, only tell them if you think their excuse is good enough. And the number we gave her was 404 OK, because it was a stupid joke. But anyway, she had so much, so much fun with it. People would call her and be like, hey, can I just get your antivirus thing? And she's like, she would give them some fake thing. We didn't tell her to do that. But she started getting exposure to all these people who were trying these different things. They got to see uh, social engineering tactics, because they got to try them. And then they wouldn't be as susceptible for them. Our favorite one was she actually told some guy who was kind of persistent but bad. He, she told him, it's 404, OK? He's like, yeah. And then he tried 404, and it didn't work. <laughs> so again, we didn't tell her to do that, but, but she did. Anyway, that's all I have. Uh, that's what I look like on Twitter. This is what I look like in real life. Here's my contact info if you want to reach out to me. And I'll be in the back later. I think I'm out of time, so I'll answer questions back there. Thank you. <laughs>